You ready to get into the word of the Lord today? All right, so glad you're here. I've got a word for somebody. Jeremiah 1, verse 5. Jeremiah 1, verse 5. Touch three people, tell them we're going to have a good time today. We're going to have a good time. Thank you, Lord. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I set you apart. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. All right, take somebody by the hand. We'll get right into it. Father, again, we thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for a worshiping church, and I thank you for a praying church. Lord, we're expecting great things today, signs, wonders, and miracles. As we've come gathered in your name, we're expecting just to hear your voice today. So, Father, we push everything to the side to hear from you, every hindrance, anything that, any distraction. Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts today. Thank you, Father, for all that you're doing in our lives. We praise you. I want you to take just a moment, take a deep breath. Say, Lord, speak to me today. Lord, speak to me today. I want to hear your voice in Jesus' name. If you love him, shout amen. 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 You can be seated. So glad you're here today. Everything I minister to you falls into one of three categories, and we've talked about this before, but I want to cover it again. I was praying and asking God, what do you want me to minister upon? And he says, I want you to tell the people who they are, who I am, and what I've given them. And I was walking right there around the corner, and he just downloaded that right into my heart. Tell them who I am, who they are, and what I've given them. So we're going to get into some good stuff today. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. We're going to get real today. Is that cool? All right. What I want you to do, I want you to think about all the things that have been spoken over you, maybe by friends, by family, acquaintances, things you've heard. You've allowed their words to shape who you think you are. And many times they're like chains that bind. So what I want you to do is I want you to reach up right now, pull those chains off and throw them on the floor. Can you do that? All right. Touch three people, tell them your life is about to change. So first and foremost, you have to know that the only thing that matters is what God has said about you. It's so important. You need to get that in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit. The only thing that matters is what the Word of God says, amen, and what God has said about you. Why is that important? Number one, he's God. Everybody say, he's God. He's God. And number two, because he's the only one who knows the real you. Think about that just for a minute. He's the only one that knows the real you. Isaiah 45, verse 5, New International Version. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. He says, I'm the one and only. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. He says, I'm the one that strengthens you. I'm the one that knows you. He's the only one who knows the real you, the you that you haven't even met. I want you to think with me this morning. He knows the you that he used to fellowship with before you were even born. Let's go back to Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I set you apart. He says, I've chosen you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. I want to look at those first two lines. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I remember when Sam was born, we, were, we would hold her as a little baby. And I know it's going to sound weird, but I'd say, what does Jesus look like? What does his voice sound like? Because I know she had just been in the presence of the Lord right before she was born. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I'd say, what does Jesus look like? The reason I did that is that's the closest I can get to eternity before I take my last breath and step into it. Are you with me? So I would ask her that. She had just been with God. We've talked about this before, but I want to dive deeper into it. God knows the real you. The you before the accident, before the sickness, before the trauma, before the divorce. God knows the you before someone's words started forming who you think you are. Their words form who you think you are. Did you catch that? The enemy has sent things against you to wreck the way that you see yourself. So anything that you do with the rest of your life comes from that identity and the thoughts and the insecurities that come along with it. But that is not your identity. That's just something you went through, something you had to endure. Somebody say amen. Don't allow your experiences to become your identity. All right? If you, 
We're going to get into some, just some stuff the way I used to preach. Since we brought the cameras in, we've been going through grace, but we're going to get into something. So just look at your neighbor and say, welcome to freedom. <laughs> Here we go. If you are a victim of rape, incest, molestation, that is not who you are. Amen? Don't let the enemy try to give you your identity by something he did to you. Are you with me? That's all it is. It's that simple. If you think that what you've been through is who you are, then the devil knows you'll never discover who God created you to be. It's all about identity. Somebody say amen. Amen. Because what happens is you will always identify with the pain and with the heartache and the things that you've experienced, the things you've been through. So I can get up here and tell you how blessed you are. I can tell you all of these wonderful things. Grab the Bible and say this, 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 and just show you everything. But if you don't feel worthy and you don't see yourself the way that God sees you, you won't receive it. Are you with me? So we have to know who is God? Who am I and what has he given me? It's not enough just to know who, who God is if I don't know who I am. Or if I know who God is and I know who I am but I don't know what he's given me. See why the three things come together? Everybody say that's grace. So that's why God has us on this from now until he tells me to change and I don't think he's going to. So if you believe that that's your identity, the things that the enemy has put you through, you've bought into the devil's lie. So it sounds good so far, but how do I let go of years and sometimes, sometimes just decades of people speaking things over me? Can, can we be real in here this morning? If you, ever, you haven't seen family, let's say 10, 20 years, but when you go back, you still feel like the little kid. And you feel like they, even if they don't, you perceive that they see you like that little kid. Are you with me? That's what we're talking about, things like that. So let's go to Romans 12, 1 and 2 from the New Living Translation. How do we get past the years of negative things that have been spoken over us? Just elbow your neighbor. Say, I know who I am. It's important. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Now, verse 2. Don't copy the behaviors and customs, behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How does he do that? By changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. This isn't our subject for today, but check this out. Everybody say, check this out. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. What is God's will? It's always good. It's always pleasing. It's always perfect. It is not God's will for you to be sick. It's not God's will for you to be depressed and discouraged. Amen? Amen. You may go through a bit of brokenness and discouragement, but it's not God's will for you to stay there. Somebody say amen real loud. Amen. Amen. Then you will, (laughs) thank you. (laughs) Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you. Let God transform you into a new person. That's your identity. How does he do that? By changing the way you think. It's the renewing of the mind. So who's doing the transforming? God is. He's going to transform me into a new person. This is not the power of positive thinking. God is going to do the work, but you have to surrender yourself to give him something to work with. If God is going to transform me, then I can't hold anything back. Somebody say amen. I believe this is why God allows us to go through brokenness. He will not force himself on us. He won't overpower you with his will. So he will allow us to make dumb decisions and stupid mistakes until we get up to a place of brokenness. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He will allow us. He doesn't send. I don't believe he sends us to that place to get hurt, but he allows us just to step back. He'll step back and he said, go ahead. And you'll make those decisions that get you to a place of brokenness. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Finally, we say, all right, Lord, now I need help. Anybody ever been there? Sometimes rock bottom is actually good for us. Maybe it doesn't feel like it at the time, but looking back, it is. Jesus went through the Garden of Gethsemane, the crushing place, the place of pressing. Talk about being broken. He sweat great drops of blood. He was sweating blood. That's stress. That's brokenness. In this moment, Jesus was face to face with his identities. This is who I am. I am the sacrifice for the sins of the world. Brokenness has a way of stripping off everything that doesn't really matter. Anybody ever been there? I have. In his brokenness, he cries out, not my will, but thine be done. What happened? The father did the transforming in his own son. He says, 
if it be your will, just take this cup from me. From me. I don't even know if, I, Jesus was saying this, I don't know if I want to go through this. Just take this cup from me. And he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He knew this is who I am. This is why I was sent to earth. This is why I was born. So I want to ask you this morning, could the situation in your life, could the brokenness be setting you up to discover your true identity? Could the things that you've suffered, the things that you're enduring, could it be setting you up so that you discover who God created you to be? What the devil sent to destroy you could actually become a tool in the hand of God to show you who you were created to be. And I want to announce to you this morning, you haven't even discovered who God created you to be yet. I'm telling you the truth. You're about to. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm about to. It's awesome. So how do I get through this test that I'm in? Anybody in a test? How do I get through the turmoil, the stress? How do I allow God to transform me into a new person? Let's go to Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So let us lay aside every weight. Strip off every weight. Anything that might slow you down, you have to get rid of it. This can be relationships priorities that are in the wrong place, any distraction, anything that weighs us down. And here's how we do it. Check out the very next verse, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. Everybody say that. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So what is grace all about? Looking unto Jesus, right? Grace is all about what Jesus has done, the finished works of Christ on the cross. So if you're serious about discovering who God created you to be, you'll never get there by looking at your circumstances, at your problems, the things you've suffered, the pain, the heartache. Are you with me? Looking unto is way different than looking at. How many are familiar with Lytle Pool? The big pool, right? If I'm in the deep end and all of a sudden I get cramps in both legs, I'm like, oh! You ever got a cramp while you're swimming? If I'm looking at the lifeguard, I say, the lifeguard's over there. If I'm looking unto the lifeguard, it's, help! (laughs) Everybody just holler, help. (laughs) That's what I'm talking about. Looking unto the lifeguard is saying, I believe you have the ability to come save me. I know that you're able to get me out of the mess that I'm in. Looking not at Jesus, looking unto. You have the ability to come transform me. You have the ability to pull me out of the mess that I'm in. Somebody say amen. Amen. Just throw, can we just have church this morning? Throw up your hands and just say, help. Amen. Amen. (laughs) Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The author and finisher of our faith. That word our is in italics, which means it it was added later. So the original language says the author and finisher of faith. Our faith comes from Jesus. He's the author and the originator of faith. You can't get saved without faith. You have to believe. Look at your neighbor and say, you have to believe. You have to believe Jesus is the Son of God. And then it says that he is the finisher of our faith. Have you ever been around an expert carpenter? Any expert carpenters in the room? No hands going. <laughs> you try? All right. A carpenter will have two sets of hammer or two, two sets of nailers. He'll have a, a framing hammer and a finishing hammer. Framing nailer and a finishing nailer. Are you with me? The framing hammer is usually really big and heavy, right guys? And it's for two by fours, two by sixes, two by eight studs, floor joists, the two by fours behind the drywall. But then the finishing hammer is for the trim that you see around the door and around the windows. You don't want a framing hammer for that, right? Because it's for finishing. You don't want big dents in the trim. And that's what, what this is talking about. Looking unto Jesus, the author, the originator, and the finisher. So when he's working on your faith, he knows what tool to use. Somebody say amen. So when you first get saved, it may be he brings in heavy equipment. He's the originator, but then as you're maturing in the Lord, he fine-tunes your faith. He comes in and he begins to finish and perfect your faith. Are you with me this morning? It's so powerful. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus knows exactly how to build your faith. Everybody say focus. Our focus has to be on Jesus, not on the pain, not on what you've been through. Are you with me? Our focus has to be on Christ, not on the disappointment, not on the sickness, 
the turmoil, the stress, the confusion. We've talked about this before. Remember the children of Israel when the poisonous snakes bit them? They weren't supposed to look at the snake bite. They were to look at the snake on the pole. Are you all with me? They had to see their sickness and infirmity on the cross. What was the battle over? The battle was over their focus. Are you going to look at the pain or are you going to look at the cross? The snake on the pole was a foreshadowing of Jesus on the cross. So I want you to ask your neighbor, just ask him, say, what are you looking at? What are you looking Are you looking at the problem? Are you looking at the snake bite? Are you looking at what you've been through? Or are you looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? Somebody say amen. amen. If you really want to discover who God created you to be, you have to look unto Jesus. Now touch three people, tell them, watch this. Watch this. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, enduring its shame. So how did Jesus make it through? He fixed his eyes on the other side of the cross, on the other side of the pain. He looked through the pain and the suffering to a time on the other side when he would get reunited with us. You do know that the joy on the other side of the cross was us, don't you? Somebody ought to say amen. He pushed through the pain, the suffering, the torment, the agony, the separation from his father for you and for me. He made it through because he fixed his eyes on the other side. And today God is speaking faith, hope, and life into you because he knows that what you've experienced thus far and what you're going through right now is not who you are. It's not who you are. It's just something you're going through. Jesus isn't the Jesus that we see hanging on the wall. Jesus isn't the Jesus we wear around our neck. Endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is seated right now in heavenly places, a place of honor next to his heavenly Father. Somebody say amen. amen. That's who we worship. That's his identity. And he sent me here today to tell you, fix your eyes on Jesus. Stop looking at the problem. Stop looking at the snake bite and begin to look to the cross, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Look at your neighbor and say, fix your eyes on Jesus. I want to tell you this morning, when you come out of this, he's going to show you who you really are. You ever come out of a, just a, a problem and you feel stronger on the other side? You think you're going to die in the middle of it, but when you come out, you're like, man, I'm tougher than I thought I was. That's what he's telling you this morning. When you come out of this, you're going to look back and say, man, I, I'm stronger than I thought I was. I have strength that I didn't even know that God gave me. Amen? Can we just talk this morning? When you get done feeling sorry for yourself, he'll show you why you had to go through it. If you can't say amen, just say ouch. <laughs> I'll say ouch too. <laughs> Don't we like to throw pity parties? Yeah, all right, we'll keep on moving. Romans 8, 28. <laughs> this is really cool. And we know that all things work together for good. How many things? Most things, many things, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called, say I'm the called, the called according to his purpose. So we're going to talk just a little bit about me. How did I make it through my mess that we talked about last week? How did I keep moving forward when friends and family betrayed me? We didn't have a building. We didn't have money. We didn't have influence. So I focused my eyes on Jesus and where he was taking me. And where was that? Where I'm standing right today. Are you with me? I knew that on the other side of the lies, on the other side of the rumors and the gossip, that we would have a church full of people who genuinely love each other. That's a good place to shout right there. Now, I don't care about having a church full of people. I want you to love each other. Amen? Amen. I knew we would have an awesome band. And we do. Let's give the Lord praise for that. Amen. I knew we would be debt free. That's big right there too. Amen. I knew we would see signs, wonders, and miracles in this room. And we do. Amen. I knew God would use this ministry to restore families and heal marriages. I knew he would use us to send people around the world to minister to the nations. Amen. He's doing all that. That's why I kept walking. That's why we kept walking. Because we saw on the other side, if we can just make it through this storm, if we can make it through the, over this hurdle, on the other side, there are some great things coming toward me. Somebody say amen. amen. 
So I want to encourage you this morning. I want you to get this in your heart. The level of attack launched against you is an indication of the level of blessing on the other side. Look at your neighbor say, it's big. <laughs> the level of attack launched against you is a direct indication of the level of blessing on the other side. Man, the bigger the battle, the bigger the blessing. I'm ready to reap some of that, aren't you? <laughs> That's why I know that this isn't it. What you see today, this is not it. I went through way too much to just stop here. Amen? Amen. And you too. I know God is not done working in my life. The more I go through, the more he reveals to me. So I want to encourage you this morning. Look at your neighbor and say, don't give up now. This is what I always ask myself and I want to ask you. Don't you want to see why the enemy is fighting so hard? Don't you want to live long enough to see why in the world did you launch an all-out assault against me? A little, little guy in Mattoon, Illinois, right? Why did you try to take me and my family out? Why did you try to take the church out? Why did he try to take you out? There is something on the other side of the test that you're going through right now, a huge blessing on the other side that you're about to walk into, amen? Touch three people, tell them you're really close, you're really close, you're really close. So I want to ask you, don't you want a taste of it before life is over? See, that's what motivated me. Because I know Sam's going to go on to do great things. And I want her to, if God calls her into ministry, go into ministry. Whatever we're doing, take it that much further. Double it, triple it, whatever. But I want to see some of it while I'm still alive. Amen? That's what motivates me, to keep going. I have too much invested in this. Pain, heartache, prayer. Amen? I want to see it. On the way to your feet this morning, I want you to encourage someone today and tell them, you're almost there. You're almost there. Go ahead and stand to your feet this morning. You're almost there. You're almost there. Don't get discouraged. I want you to look at the person next to you and just tell them, don't give up. Tell them, don't give in. All right. You're going to reap if you faint not, all right? You're almost there. I come just to encourage you this morning. Don't give up. Now I want you to think we woke up this morning and there was storming out and right before service started and some rain went over. No matter how big the storm, if it's from the entire state of Illinois is covered, if you keep walking, eventually you'll walk out of it. Doesn't matter how big it is. If you keep walking, touch three people, tell them keep walking. Keep, walking. keep walking. You're about to come out of this storm. You're about to come out of this. Come on, let's give God the glory this morning. Amen. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. It's just a season you're going through. I don't know what you're going through, but the Lord had me preach an encouraging word today. Don't give up. Don't give in. You're about to make it out. You're right on the brink of a breakthrough. Look at your neighbor and say, you're that close. Now, I want you to be nice, but we're going to have fun in here this morning. Is that all right? They're so close. If you shoved them, they'd probably fall into it. Just give them a little push. <laughs> Bruce, be nice. <laughs> I told him that one time, and Renee went, <laughs> All right, reach over, take somebody by the hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for an encouraging word. You're almost there. I can feel that in my heart, in my spirit. You're almost there. Don't give up. Don't give in. Somebody watching online right now, the Spirit of the Lord is ministering to you. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't throw in the towel. You're almost there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You're almost there. The level of attack that has been launched against you is an indication of the blessing on the other side. And think of what you've been through. Think of what the enemy has thrown at you. There is a huge blessing that you're getting ready to step into. And so he just keeps throwing things at you, hoping that you'll give up. But you're not a quitter. Amen? You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. You're the first and not the last. Thank you, Jesus. You're blessed in the city. You're blessed in the field. You're blessed going in. You're blessed coming out. Everywhere the sole of your foot shall trod. God says you're on soil, on land that I've given you. You are blessed everywhere you go. When you go to work, your job is blessed because you walked in the door. Your home is blessed. Your family is blessed. Your marriage is blessed. Your bank account is blessed. Somebody say amen. amen. You are carrying the presence of the spirit of the living God. He's on the inside of you. So when you go anywhere, the atmosphere has to change. Because I know who he is. I know who I am. And I know what he's given me. 
That's why he has me ministering on this. Do you see it? We know who he is. We know who we are. And we know what he's given us. So things have to change. When you speak, mountains move. When you speak, demons flee. You need to be speaking over your life. You need to be speaking over your marriage, over your finances, over your family, over your home, over your career. You need to be speaking the things of God, what his word says. Words are not just for communication. They're tools to release power. We're going to do a little bit of heart check just for a minute. If they really are tools... To, to release power, what have you been speaking? Because the words that we speak are going to be backed by heaven or hell. If you begin to speak negativity and things that are not in line with the word of God, God cannot come and back that with his power. So the enemy says, I will. Are you getting this? That's why it's so important. And the Bible says, don't let an idle word come out of our mouth. Because the enemy says, I'll back that up. And unfortunately, some of us in this room have grown up with parents speaking those things over us. Negative words. And they begin to stick to us like glue. Not anymore. Not anymore. Because I know who God is. I know who I am and I know what he's given me. It's all about identity. When you know who you are, nobody can rattle you anymore. Nobody can say, this is who he is, this is what he did. That, no, that's not who I am. Are you with me this morning? Receiving this? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are a warrior. You are a soldier in the army of God. You are blessed and highly favored. Thank you, Lord. Like we said last week, you are not what you've been through. It's something that happened to you. Just say this. Say, I know who I am. I know who I am. Now, I want you to think with me. I'm almost finished. I know who I am. When you really know who you are, the enemy cannot touch you. I want you to think with, about that. When you really know who you are, I'm a child of the Most High King. I know who God is. I know who I am. I know what he's given me. The enemy cannot wreck you anymore. People struggle because they don't know who they are in Christ. That's what grace is all about. Revealing who we are, what he's done for us.